started in filmmaking uh, probably when I was pretty young. I always had an interest in, in, in filmmaking uh, just because back in the day, and I'm talking about probably in the, uh, in the uh, late 80s, <laughs> early 90s, we had access to um, video cameras and things like that. But, you know, my father had a video camera and, uh, and I started to play around with that stuff. And through high school, I, I, I uh, started making documentaries in high school and I wasn't even aware that that was the kind of the medium that I was working in. But I was, uh, I made a cinema verite documentary when I was in, um, in uh, senior year in uh, high school. And, uh, and after that, knew immediately that I wanted to get into film making and so I went to Concordia and I studied film production. Up the Yangtze uh, is a film that was initially inspired by a, 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 an experience I had uh, traveling uh, on a cruise ship with my, on my parents' invitation and, uh, and that experience for me as someone who's a sort of cynical and uh, somewhat uh, uh, you know, a little bit uh, jaded by that uh, that kind of experience, I felt a, a, a little irony in, in the process of joining this cruise ship uh, that happened to be uh, this cruise ship known as the Farewell Cruise. And these are these uh, so-called goodbye tours that they would uh, take uh, tourists from around the world on the Yangtze River, which at the time in 2000 and 2006 was uh, the last year of the um, flooding phase of the, three, the Yangtze River because of the largest dam in the world. They're building, a, they built at the time the Three Gorges Dam. And, um, and I felt that uh, there were so many uh, layers um, connecting uh, the boat with the river, with with China, with modern China, with you know the essence of what progress means, uh, questioning what that means through the cruise ship, and so I decided to make a film about it, and uh, I um, I researched for a couple of years on the project, and I found uh, my subjects. Uh, uh, one was a young girl whose home was uh, on the banks of the Yangtze River, meaning that it would be flooded uh, the year that I would begin filming. And uh, she gets a job on one of these cruise ships. And uh, for me, it was uh, this little microcosm you have, uh, this microcosm of a kind of a society, of an upstairs, downstairs world on this cruise ship, where below decks you have the Chinese workers, and above decks you have sort of the uh, foreigners and the tourists and, um, and wealthy Chinese as well. And so it was, uh, for me, an exploration of uh, modernity uh, through the guise of this microcosm, through the voice of Chinese subjects, um, to get a sense of um, the bigger picture issue, that being of modernization through the eyes of these um, subjects who were directly experiencing um, torrential change in China. You know, this was my first feature documentary. It was um, my first approach into cinema verite filmmaking, more so than a film I had made uh, a few years earlier uh, with the uh, National Film Board called Earth to Mouth. It was a medium-length documentary shot in eastern Ontario about uh, migrant Mexican migrant workers uh, working on a, um, on a Chinese-operated farm that was growing Chinese vegetables in uh, southeastern Ontario. So it was, um, for that experience, jumping into Yangtze, it was a very different world. To me, there was, uh, the, other, the other process for me was about um, learning about China on a personal level and reconnecting with, uh, with a cultural um, background and, and, uh, uh, and history that I was not, uh, that I didn't grow up with completely. So, um, uh, so the 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 approach to making up the Yangtze was uh, it was highly emotional. I mean, we were in a, a and we were shooting under the radar, so we were shooting without permission. Uh, that meant that we had to be very very careful how we were shooting. And um, I worked with a Chinese film crew that was part of the the game plan was to to build a crew that was was comprised of filmmakers from China and 
my cinematographer Wang Shiqing, as a Beijing filmmaker, and um, Li Xing Fan, who went on to make Last Train Home. He was my uh, sound recordist and my and my translator, and um, and that was our little unit. And we had another guy, Michael M K Siu, who's from Toronto. He was my uh, my post production kind of um, coordinator, and he was. He was based we, in in the city where we were, f our home base. We basically shipped everything and we relocated to Chongqing, which is the largest municipality in the world. It's a uh, uh, 30 million population Canada, and the the cruise ship actually begins its journey from the city Chongqing, or it's also known as Chongqing. And uh, so that we we got a little place there and we pretty much uh, moved in for a, a year to shoot the film. Uh, we had a lot of experiences where it was uh, not easy to film. Uh, we filmed with, you know, there are many storylines that didn't even make it into the movie. And that was sort of the objective, to get a survey of what was going on in China along the Yangtze River. Through the voice of the people along the river, um, perhaps we'd get a deeper sense of uh, the, the epic changes happening to their society, to their personal lives, to the kind of the... Uh, um, their human rights. Um, uh, meanwhile, all focusing on on the trajectory of a young girl on this cruise ship who's adjusting to um, to having to work on this boat. Uh, the irony of her having to learn English to get an English name, and that kind of conflict that in, it entails. That it's uh, uh, that there's great pressure to be. Uh, to, a, to acclimatize to a new society is not easy. Um, and in the film, we also contrast her story with that of a boy uh, named Jerry Chumbuyu. And Chumbuyu is a, you know, the, the exact opposite of Yu Shui, and uh, Yu Shui is the girl. And Chumbuyu is a very cocky, arrogant character. He sort of takes on the, in my mind, the kind of the corrupt character that one must become to be able to be successful in. In, uh, in modern China. Um, all the while, we're leading up to the, to the final uh, flooding. And, uh, and I think, you know, making the film, you go into it sometimes thinking that, all right, this is what I'm going to say. This is, this is my point of view. This is, you know, this is a very, for me, uh, this is going to be a black and white story, you know. It's bad the, what's happening to uh, the relocatees and the million people that have to move that we acknowledge. But, and then, but when I started making the film, it got, uh, got a lot more complex um, in the fact that uh, I questioned, you know, in that, you know, it's easy often as Westerners to, from an outside point of view to impose a point, sort of point of view onto another country. Um, and we can, and you know, it's even the you know the Chinese government has got a lot of issues, a lot of problems, and they they have a lot of problems with human rights, uh, and a lot of their policies are, are wrong. Uh, but I think that uh, um, that's different. It, it it's also often quite separate from the people. Uh, who live everyday lives um, and almost in, in near poverty along the river, and obviously they are somewhat uh, affected by these policies of the government, but also these people are quite removed from it as well. They're trying to live a life. And um, that notion of trying to live a life, trying to succeed, trying to just kind of climb out of their situations, uh, to me became very complex. And in, in some ways, uh, to begin a sort of a, a critical point of view on the girl working on the boat, Yushui working on the boat and saying that, and, and in my mind thinking that it was something negative, in the end sort of turned out to be a lot muddier to me in the fact that she was able to support her family uh, who were in China, you know, you call them their, their peasant family and uh, they're just uh, subsistence farmers and uh, they don't make a lot of money. I think the, the amount in 2006 was $200 Canadian a year was their annual income and uh, and that is a pittance and so uh, Yu Shui by contrast was making the same amount per month and so I had you know you start when you start digging deeper and you start developing this the uh, the film and uh, it goes way beyond uh, 
us that kind of um, that uh, that perspective of being a filmmaker. I think you get very close and attached to your subjects. You get uh, and and it's a. I think filmmaking is a process of of discovery. It's about um, about really not having concrete answers, and uh, and there, there's no there shouldn't be a, a, such a thing as a hypothesis when you go in to make a documentary film. I think it 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 has to be explorative, explorative, is it explore, explorative or explorative, explorative. <laughs> It has to be a process of exploration, and um, that experiential uh, uh, um, kind of investigation will then uh, affect how you will edit your film and, and the sort of uh, point of view you want to leave at the end of this movie. And for me, it was one of uh, complexity, one of uh, uh, maybe sort of ominous as well, uh, but. Uh, Clearly, no clear answer as to the future of uh, the country and the subjects in the film. That is how the movie ends. You know, the, we op we Yushui is uh, lying in her bunk, and uh, the three they're passing through the Three Gorges Dam locks, uh, the gates of the Three Gorges Dam, and it opens up, and and she enters into the abyss. And I think that. That was, uh, you know, we finished the film in 2007, and, uh, you know, I think there is a certain relevance in that, and in, in how that film concludes. What I like about uh, documentary film, and I, I like all sorts of documentary filmmaking. I like the Michael Moore types of documentary films. I like investigative, uh, journalistic documentaries, um, Taxi to the Dark Side, for example. Um, but I was inspired by the National Film Board of Canada's, uh, the NFB's uh, films that they had made in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and you know, the film board really did uh, invent and craft this, this medium of so-called cinema verite, or direct cinema. And I remember watching uh, Lonely Boy, which is about uh, Paul Anka, and that was a, uh, a very um, uh, sort of an amazing, eye-opening um, documentary for me. Just the way that uh, there's this acknowledgement of the of uh, the presence of the filmmakers, yet they are uh, um, they're trying they're shooting in a way that uh, feels as if there's no one really there. But it's so observant the way the camera moves. Um, so I was really inspired by that stuff. I love, I like fiction filmmaking too, and I wanted to, coming out of Concordia, I wanted to focus on fiction filmmaking. Um, but I think that we have, uh, at the time, we had a very supportive sort of government where we were able to uh, make films that are largely, uh, you know, that, you know, I had a link into the National Film Board, and, and for me that was a great opportunity. Um, and I think that uh, I like telling a narrative story through documentary filmmaking. I like obfuscating the feeling that there is a filmmaker behind a camera. I like to immerse the uh, audience and get a sense that we're watching something that almost feels fictional. And, but there's always that little, that little um, sensation that this is, uh, you know, this is more than fiction. It's, it's reality. And, and that's what I always gravitate to uh, that idea of, uh, um, of, of the, uh, you know, of the, the, the idea that it's uh, the reality of the story it takes it to the next level is something that always um, is very profound and can be uh, uh, sometimes cathartic and often uh, as a filmmaker you, uh, when I approach a film in the cinema verite technique, I think that um, um, I think what is nice about that process is that uh, even though it's very subjective, you know, we're crafting a story that is, um, that's told through our uh, points of view, through what we want to tell, through how we want to point the camera and how we want to put two shots together. Uh, nonetheless, um, there is a, a process by which when, the, when you have completed the film, the Cinema Verite film, um, the audience, the viewer, is able to uh, 
uh, interpret many different avenues in that, in that kind of this, this, uh, this entity of a, of a movie. You're able to um, navigate different emotions and different feelings, different perspectives through a, a cinema verite film, which can be very different from a Michael Moore film, let's say. Well, support for uh, filmmakers and for the arts has always been a, a sort of a mandate of, the, of Canada. And we have funding agencies and grant support systems like the Canada Council for the Arts, like SODEC, uh, like the National Film Board of Canada, whose sole mission is to help artists and filmmakers make the, the projects and, and uh, the stories that they want to tell. And um, granted, let's say we're better off than uh, uh, artists in perhaps uh, America and the U.S. Uh, there's a totally different system of filmmaking and funding in, in, in that part of the world than there is here. Uh, but uh, now, in this day and age, and we're talking about in 2012, it's almost like we've regressed uh, to a, a time that puts us almost in a position of having to look into uh, different avenues of funding our films, which in some ways compromises the filmmaking. I think that if we have to follow the American way, which would be the, the way of uh, looking for private funding, private investors, um, I feel like there's, uh, um, first of all, there's a negotiation in the um, the kind of story you have to tell, that perhaps it has to be more commercial when you're dealing with an investment that needs to be uh, recouped. Um, and also that uh, uh, it just means that you, you're, f you're dealing with a different type of filmmaking. I think that um, we're lucky in Canada that we do, and personally, I can speak personally, that I was able to make up the Yangtze, and no, granted it was not easy, it took you know, years to, make the, to get the money to make the film, uh, but, um, but there used to be a sort of support system for this kind of uh, filmmaking. Now, in 2012, I think that um, emerging filmmakers are going to be going through a different um, and a more difficult process of getting money. And, um, and it's and it's and I'm saying this because you have programs like the Filmmakers Assistance Program at, at NFB that got slashed, and you've got uh, you know a lot of funding sources are being cut back. Um, I don't think that Canada Council for the Arts has been affected yet, but you know it's I think it's more than just the idea of not of money being disappearing. It's I think also the principle of it, and the principle of it is that uh, as a as a social state, as a Canada being a social state that supports the arts, uh, uh, when you start losing that and cutting that away, you are uh, you're cutting off the voices of uh, of of you're cutting off the voices of Canada. You're cutting off um, you, you know a critical uh, outlook onto society that is so necessary in in a kind of a uh, democratic nation and you know when when I was in China making up the Yangtze and when I make when I made the new film China heavyweight uh, you know you take it for granted when you when you realize that uh, um, you know many people in China if they want to talk about something that is on the extreme of, of voicing an opinion that is kind of political political or or um, you know, religious or something like this, that that they may encounter problems. Uh, you you realize we're very lucky here in, in Canada, and I think that um, and one of those reasons is because we do have resources to be able to to make our films, and so um, I, it's saddening now to know that there's problems like this, uh, and it and and. Uh, endemic problems, it's something to do maybe with the current government, and I hope that things will change.
So right now I'm uh, I'm just I've just completed a film that uh, played at uh, Sundance and it, and it was at Hot Docs. It's called China Heavyweight. It's an it's a film about um, uh, about boxing in China and it follows a a master coach and his two students in rural Sichuan, China. And, uh, and the film is like in, in the way that Up the Yangtze used a microcosm of the cruise ship. This uses the microcosm of boxing and explores the notion of individualism in China versus uh, the idea of collective, uh, the collective. And, um, you know, I think it has that big picture kind of perspective. And yet, uh, what for this film I really tried to do China Heavyweight was really trying to make it much more a narrative story. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I got rid of the voice of God, I got rid of the personal narration, and, uh, and it starts and ends as if it was a, a fiction film. And I, I think that I like that technique and that process. Um, and that movie now is playing in theaters, and, uh, and it will oh, it'll start playing in the U.S. in the summer. Um, and those traveling festivals. Uh, I am also in the editing room right now on a new documentary, very different from Cinema Verite. I would say that it's a little more veering towards uh, a combination of, like a hybrid of fiction and, and, um, and, uh, and documentary. And, and it's about exotic fruit. It's called The Fruit Hunters. And it uses that, again, that idea of this, you know, it's a sweeping topic, a film about fruit. But at its core, it's, it's about preserving uh, diversity in the face of monoculture. Um, and so we follow people whose uh, sole life objectives are to preserve and collect and to, and to, uh, and to propagate uh, varieties of fruit that may become extinct. And so we travel around the world with some of these subjects. Cinema Politica is, I mean, I think uh, it's such an important um, uh, uh, network and film festival. Uh, I don't know how Politica, Cinema Politica describes uh, their, their mandate, but I know that uh, uh, it's very engaged uh, politically through cinema, and that um, is so important to foster the idea that uh, you know movies can move people, literally. Uh, I realized that when I made up the Yangtze and I traveled with the film around the world, and and people uh, felt like doing something, they f were moved to action, uh, and that's that's almost uh, that's the the. That is a, a powerful um, idea of what movies can do. It can be cathartic. It can, be, um, it can make your blood boil when you make a film that is about uh, political issues, about uh, human rights, environment. You know, the list goes on. But films that are, that are, are um, engaged uh, with, uh, with current affair issues, um, films that, uh, you know, it runs the gamut. But just at the core, I think Cinema Politica realizes and, is, and, and the way they, um, they've, you know, honed their objective, uh, uh, that the power of cinema can move you to action, I think is, uh, is, is a very, very valuable and something that uh, is here to stay, I hope. Yeah.